Welcome everyone to the NDLC, principle number 10, lead by example. I'm super excited um, with dynamics of changing schedules and everything as we can all see. Um, we'll have hopefully have some more NDLC join us, but right now we have the incredible Marty Dutch and Dr. Vanessa Matinaj. Oh, I say that doctor, I get it, never is gonna get old. Anyway, um, so thank you very much. And we're gonna have Marty's gonna host us. So take it away. Well, welcome everybody. I get to lead the conversation today. Um, the pillar that we're focusing on is um, lead by example. And so when, you know, I was just kind of processing, you know, how do we wanna have this conversation? Uh, I did some research on, you know, leaders that are doing it by example, you know, what's going on in the, in the workplace related to leading by example. And it's an interesting topic because, you know, in this changing dynamics of the business world and, you know, what's appropriate, not appropriate, uh, leading by example is probably the best way to affect change and strengthen organizations. So, but what does that look like? So I thought we would start by, you know, asking the group, you know, examples of when you have led by example or when you've been impacted by somebody who is a really good leader that, that leads by example. And I can I can kick this off by, and this is probably one of my favorite stories to share, is that um, in my previous employment, I was hired by a gentleman that he was a former estate planning attorney and just had this passion for philanthropy and legacy planning and doing um, protecting families from sometimes what uh, documents have been set up or you know, trust and estate planning that kind of does damage with families, um, families that aren't, you know, seeing the passion of if you add philanthropy as an option for families, how that strengthens families. And um, I have this juxtaposition of his area of expertise. And then the second person at the firm was this woman who's a clinical psychologist who I really thought that was who I was following and wanted to work with because she was doing legacy planning with families. And, um, but, you know, she was, had her head down, was doing the work and Doug Freeman, who's a gentleman that was, um, my inspirational leader, he just, um, you know, was doing this work Any, I watched him operate on the planet, helping anyone who called him. And then, so he's a super busy man. People would call him. They said, I'm in a dilemma. I need some help. I need, and he would drop everything and sit and take a meeting with them. And uh, he also was very open. Like if I saw something interesting on his calendar, I would say, can I go with you? And he'd say, why? And I said, because I want to learn that. I want to see what you're doing. I want to watch you do it. And he would always say yes and invite me in. And when um, that experience with him taught me two things. One, it was the example of the leader I want to be. So I really want to, when someone says, gosh, what you're doing is really interesting. Can I learn more? I always say yes. And I, and I always try and bring them in to see what this kind of work look, looks like. And the, the other thing was having that passion for what you do, I think is a, is a leadership quality where when you show up all the time and you can tell that someone loves what they do and you, it's out of priority and they um, wanna engage everybody in it, you know, those are leadership qualities that, that I was so impressed by. And reflecting on it, I've never had such a good mentor in my life. And, and when you have that kind of that person who's rooting for you and wants to see you succeed, it just empowers you to do better. And he would push me out in front at times when I didn't think I was ready and um, just really took an active uh, role in my career development and trying to get me placed in the right places when I'd have speaking opportunities or things that he knew were going to advance, advance my career. And so that's the leadership that I hope I'm doing. I, that is the bar that I have set for myself. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's, there's a difference between um, one interesting anecdote when I was doing the research for this is the difference between managing and leading. So managing is tactical. It's holding people accountable. It's important. It's a piece of it, you know, but leading is that, posture that you bring to the table. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I hold up is 
you know, how do you operate when no one's looking? You know, it's that level of leadership, it's that level of integrity that I think is so important in leadership. And it, it in thinking through this um, and wanting to share that story, I, I realized that one per you never know who that one person is that you get this type of relationship like I had with Doug, how much it can change your life because I really feel like he changed my life. And when um, you know, I see him, like I get choked up, like I have that kind of emotional response. I'm so grateful that he um, invested in me. And imagine nobody, we don't have the energy to do that with everybody, but imagine you got that opportunity with a few. And you think about the ripple effect of that going down the generations, uh, it really can make a big difference. So I was grateful and I, I hope that I, I hope I'm, you know, emulating his, um, his leadership, leading by example, um, moving forward. So Kelly, I'm so glad you're here. Yay. Um, Thank you. So, and, and so, um, Vanessa, do you want to share the same question and, and you know, how, how you reflected on that question when I shared it with everybody? I love that you had a really great mentor who took you under his wing and that you asked, that you were not afraid to say, you know what, can I go with you? Because that also takes courage to speak out that you want to learn from somebody. So I commend you for your leadership as well and being vulnerable, right, to asking for help. Uh, I run the community lending division and I've always done affordable lending. And when you're committed to helping that segment of first time home buyers or move up buyers, you really have to walk the walk and talk the talk. I love to lead by example because I am that person. And when I look at solutions and how we can move the needle on becoming a homeowner and really um, impacting that and build generational wealth, I'm all in. So you have to lead by example and really know your craft, understand guidelines, understand the community needs and be really authentic and be, again, bringing a team on board that's gonna have that same vision and that same passion of moving the needle of sustainable homeownership. So when I look, I try to lead always by example and be that selfless leader because those are traits that I think are, are what makes a good leader and also knowing your craft really well. If you're gonna be in certain industries, you better understand and know how Lona has done, the guidelines, the importance, and everything is ever changing, like in every industry, right? We keep changing, but you have to change with it and understand what's happening to the market and keep track of trends, of guidelines, what's happening now, and also with your peers, your competitors. Because I'm working at one particular, one particular bank, I still support other banks and their decisions and what they're doing, because you have to know what your, your uh, your industry is doing and then your peers because you want to be have that comp competitive advantage but also celebrate their wins as well so as a leader you want to know walk the walk talk the talk know your your guidelines know your industry but also celebrate others wins because together we're stronger and i don't see it as a threat when i'm working in one company as opposed to another because i want us all to celebrate because if one person advance we all advance uh, so that's always been my point of view of leading by example and trying to be that selfless leader. But I have had many mentors in my career that have given me that opportunity and say, you know what, there's something in you. I believe in you. And that's really important when you have a, a mentor or, or your mentee that they believe in you and they give you their best. I, I honestly think that most humans, most of us want the best for everybody else, that they're innate goodness in everyone. So uh, one of my mentors, he was my past manager, love him. I've known him over 20 years. He was just one of those shining, bright individuals that had that passion for talk. And when I met him at a conference, I was like, oh my God, this man is amazing. He speaks from the heart, but he has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And he, he captures it, right? So you're enthralled in what he's saying. But more than that, he has that passion and that commitment. And I'm like, oh my God, this man should be a preacher. He should be in... Um, He's one of the best auditors that I know and speakers that I know. So that's how I met him because of his talent and his passion for, for speech. Happens to be in the same industry. So when I met him and I met him over 20 years ago, I didn't know him as I do now. But I was like, Mr. McNeil, I just want to say you are the best speaker I've ever met in the industry. 
And to this day, I still hold him in one of those top regards as the top three that I have in the industry because he gets it and he has that passion. Again, he leads by example. Um, and he's just one of those generous souls that he will take you with him as he advances, you advance as well, but also will teach you and teach you um, as a mentor and a father figure for myself. And that's just something I don't take away. So even to this day, when I see him, um, there's nothing but love and admiration there. And it's coming from a good place because he believed in me. And I know that I want to lift others in my team, in my community and in my family and friends, because I believe in them too. So it's always paying it forward and thanking those that have, you know, pulled you up along with them. And then you have to pull up somebody with you as well. Because we eventually are those mentors. And then we turn into a mentor because of experience, age, and so forth, the way you are in your career. So I think it just becomes a, a cycle here. And it's, uh, it's really great to do that for others. Because nothing makes me happier when I see others succeed in my team or in family and, and say, wow, I'm so proud of you. So we have to lead by example walk the walk, talk the talk, and also be uh, really thankful for their blessings as well. So let, let me ask you, Vanessa, and as a woman of color, yes, there's a, a extra layer of, I would call it pressure a little bit. There's, um, you know, that, that you are representing, more, you know, several things, women, um, Hispanics, you know, is there, how does that feel? How do you lead knowing that, you know, people are watching you, that you're in a, a very prestigious role that people admire? That's one part of the question. The second part of the question is when you're working with the families that need the affordable housing, you know, how does, how does that come into play when you're working with those families that maybe, you know, it's the first time they've seen a woman like you in that role. So number one, be humble at all times and act like someone's watching you all the time. Just like you say, especially in this virtual world, what are you gonna say behind closed doors is how you wanna act in public as well. You wanna be the same person behind closed doors in front of the audience and just be authentically you. And sometimes you're gonna have those bad days that you're not gonna look put on or you might say a bad word, but you're being real. So you have to be authentically you no matter what and allow for grace and also allow for others to have grace as well. Um, being a Latina, sometimes you're like, oh, you're so passionate. Yes, I am. I'm passionate about home ownership. I always have been because I know those that own a home to those who don't, there's a big difference in generational wealth, income, and also how you can become a millionaire just by owning a lot of real estate. So you do have to uh, be that person that is on and also just be you, but know that no matter what people are looking and leaders are looking and when you're, in, you might be in the room and you think no one is paying attention, they are. Be prepared to know that you're always on. So if why you're going to an event and you're like, I really don't know anyone or you might be speaking at an event or whatever, people are watching you no matter what. And so you have to act the way you would be at home and at an event and be together and know your craft. Uh, when you're helping a person, I always come from a place of what loan would I give my mother? What loan would I give myself? And that's never changed. So no matter what I'm doing for a client, an individual, a community, I'm always like, what is that best possible solution to give them into that best program out there? Because you always want to provide the best service and know that you've always tried your best because no matter what, you want to provide that, that excellent service that everyone deserves. Whether you're a billionaire, a millionaire, a first time home buyer, or someone who's just not ready and you're planting that seed, we all deserve that excellent service. So that doesn't change. Um, what might change is the level of uh, conversation with those that have a little bit more experience. But that's where you meet and you lead by example and you go to whatever level that customer or that person is able to understand. And you want to make them know that, hey, you're not the first person. You could do this, but it's going to take work. <laughs> and together we can get there. So uh, as long as I think if everybody has those good, deep values and morals, that never leaves you. That should always stay as part of your core person. So those are my answers. It may not be the right answer, but that is how I try to 
emulate and be the same person at home than I am at a conference or at work. Well, Can I, I add love something to that real quick. I, I was just going to say, I love that um, you are in the perfect job for you when you can just feel it coming through the screen. Thank and you. I, it makes me smile. It makes me so happy knowing that you are that example to those families and that, you know, there's just so many layers of when you, when you find your zone, that area that you're at your best, that you, you can reach down, pull up, you know, lead by watching, having people follow you like, oh, she can do it. I can do it. I mean, it's just, that's a wonderful package. So what a great, great example. Thank you. And so I love, I love Marty, how you said that, because you don't know Vanessa at you know, a, few, a couple of years, but I've known Vanessa for many, many years and, and she has never changed in that aura of herself to emulate the love of what she does and puts in that perspective. Um, so kudos to, to call that out. And I just want to add real quick, um, the opportunity, the unwritten rule in the government space, and you see all the shenanigans that are going on in, in DC and in the states and in the county levels. But no matter who you talk to, those interns, a lot of them are unpaid. And the people that are in those pockets and they put in the 24-7 day time frames, um, those, you treat them as if they're you know, the, the CEO, the president or whatever capacity, and you never know when that's going to come back because those are the positions that when they start, they could become the next president, they could become the next leader and someone that you want to talk to. So always be your best to everyone because you never know when it's going to come back to. And just the support you were talking about, Vanessa, how um, you're always congratulating your counterparts, no matter what bank they work for, no matter what your relationship was with whoever, you're like celebrating the fact that they can get more people into home ownership or uh, have the opportunity to access the capital, no matter where that level goes. So I just want to add that value to it. So Desiree, you are, um, I always give you a hard time that it's like, you're doing so many things I can never nail down, you know, Hey, what, how many things can you do at once? Um, but you're producing a magazine, you're leading an organization to empower women in the real estate industry. You speak at conferences, you're a subject matter expert in the area of um, housing and real estate. And so you get pulled in a lot of different directions. So when people are coming at you all the time about, um, you know, asking you to help or speak or do different things. So how do you approach leading by example? Well, um, that is something I need to manage better, <laughs> just to be honest, but it ties into exactly what I was thinking about because I'm going to take lead by example a little different for a uh, venue. Um, so in fifth grade, um, I was deemed teacher's pet. Um, Mrs. Gesson was one of my favorite teachers. And the reason I'm going back that far is, is that I would show up to school at 6 a.m. I would leave school at 6 p.m. In fifth grade, we don't do that. And what happened was, is that whatever she needed in any capacity, decorating the room, helping grade papers. And remember, this is fifth grade. Um, you know, doing things like, you know, bringing in special something for her to eat for lunch, um, you know, creating something special for her, no matter what it was, researching something, I kid you not, I did anything and everything that she wanted, um, because I, I was curious what it took to be a teacher, what her job was like, you know, how could I learn more? Because if you think about just to take a step back to, you know, what we were doing last month, um, we were talking about you know, uh, prepare for the future. We were talking about what? Knowledge is the power to transform. So in fifth grade, I wanted to know everything. So the power to ask, to understand, like Marty, you have this incredible conversation that you go, if I hear you correctly, this is what you're asking. You're always asking to quantify. So if we cannot know, if we don't understand, and we don't ask questions continuously. So I being in the room, I was living it. I was experiencing it. And well, why are you doing that? Why did you put this paper here? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? So to your point, I'm always doing everything. And how do I relate that to, you know, how do I manage my time and my, my you know, how do I lead? 
I have was the first one of the, if not the first, one of the first women to play water polo. Now it's an Olympic sport with all guys. I was always put back. And how do I lead is, is that you look at real estate. I was the one who championed the bank saying, what do you mean you don't have a women's department? You have a multicultural division for African-American, uh, Asian, Hispanic. So where, where is woman in that title? And Vanessa knew me when I was on that journey, knocking on every big bank door saying, I want one. Well, if you get someone else to do it, we'll look at it at this bank or we'll look at it at that bank. I'm like, excuse me, why can't you do? And little did I know, Union Bank had a women's own business program, the very first women-owned bank business program um, to get a loan in 1995. Who knew? But those are the kinds of things that I look at is, is that you can't know something if you don't ask. So why do I have so many different verticals that I play in and, and want to know? Because you're only strong as your weakest link. So Vanessa, champion home ownership, champion affordable housing. If you can't get a loan, you can't get the house, you can't get the build, you can't get the da 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 And then, oh my gosh, you have one sole provider and that sole provider gets sick. What are you gonna do about the ecosystem that they just fell apart on, especially in today's world? So to lead by example, if I can ask those questions, I can do the verticals in all different ways to get to know and then connect the dots and bring in the experts. Think of the council. Right. So look at the verity. How do you know these people and how they all interconnect? And 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 Kelly will say, well, Desiree, you need to write it down. And Tammy goes, just go with the flow. Just let it go. Those are the ways that I lead is, is that it might be unconventional how I do my what I do, but it, it works for me and I'm successful at what I'm doing. So the lead by example to me is it's not necessarily you have to look at this cookbook but find your lane and know your passion. And then you're going to be successful with what that is. And the energy comes out of it. So for me, it's always about if it feels right, go for the gust and make sure you never lose that drive and you'll be successful in life. Well, I think what I see in your superpower, yeah, mute. I, not, can you hear me? Okay. So what I, what I see um, as your superpower is that you create this uh, group of women that you paint a picture, like you wanna be in the cool club. You wanna be in this group because these are the smartest, the best, the most amazing women. And then, you know, most of, I think most of, I'll speak from example, like I didn't know what I was joining, but I was like, okay, I wanna be in the cool club. I mean, you know, you just have that superpower of creating that energy and you can tell that, um, you know, you want to surround yourself with greatness and that you're holding women up uh, at a really high level. Like you always make everybody that you work with be seen and valued and feel as important as everybody else in the, in the group. So I, you know, that's a leadership trait that um, really makes people want to play in your sandbox. So well done. I Thank call you. Desiree a connector and an encourager. Because she yeah. finds ways to connect people and she encourages you. So that those are huge leadership qualities. And uh, yeah, definitely, definitely something that I think makes people want to participate. Right. Okay, so Kelly, um, you know, and so someone looking at your background would not imagine that you were in the top management at UPS. I see a stuffed animal behind you and oh. bright colors <laughs> yeah. and... You know, it's so funny you go from that corporate, uh, I'm sure everything was beige at UPS because you had to be. And oh, black and blue, that's it. Dark, you know, black or navy blue. And I would show up in my pink or my purple or whatever. Yeah, I created quite a, quite a ruckus. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, and I want to hear because I think that um, you look at generationally navigating the corporate world uh, in your career, the span of your career that uh, leading by example had to come into play in a big way because, you know, I think the one thing about the Me Too movement that came out was, I always say good men didn't realize how hard it was. And, um, you know, that they were, you know, you, knew, you know, there's good people on the planet when they look at you and say, did those things really happen? Like they just were unaware because they just would never do that. And so, you know, we had a lot of bad actors back in the day and, 
you navigated that and got yourself to the top level of one of the nation's largest companies. So I would, I'm excited to hear about how you led by example or lead, continue to lead by example. <laughs> You know, um, there's so many tangents, right, to leading by example. I think Vanessa made some great points in regards to being authentic and knowing that people are watching you at all times. Um, as I, as I, I spent 30 years at UPS and I got to become the vice president of sales, and I was one of the few women many times since UPS and transportation in general was such a male-dominated field for so long, and so um, it, you. You know, as you think about leading by example, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to be able to do the positions, right, that I was asking other people to do. And at UPS, they provide a great opportunity for that because you really kind of rise up. They promote from within generally and you rise up from within. So I took literally every assignment someone wanted to give me. I mean, I really practiced saying yes a lot. And, um, and I learned so much. I went into the operations for a while. I ran one of the largest driver centers in a building. I did um, every special assignment corporately, whether it was a finance assignment, an operations assignment, or a sales assignment. Um, and I think that helped me because then when people had questions or were trying to explain how they felt about something, I could, I could relate. And I think being relatable is important. It kind of it kind of fits in there with authenticity, right? You're relatable, you're able to talk about things and you're giving really um, the best advice you can from your own experiences. So I really did try to lead. I mean, I had um, over 1200 people that reported to me throughout the sales group throughout the US. And um, I really searched for those people who were passionate. And that's, I think Vanessa showed that already, but I'm the same way, right? Don't be in this job, especially sales, where you're out in front of people all the time. Don't be in this job if you don't like it, because it, it comes across right away, right? When you're talking to a customer or a client of any type. And so I would look for those people who are passionate because I knew I could train them. I can train you to do, you know, the processes and procedures, because believe me, UPS has a ton of those. Um, but what I can't train is the enthusiasm and the desire and just that excitement, right? So I looked for those people and, and really one of my proudest moments is that at one time at UPS, 70% so of the sa senior sales leadership had come up underneath me and had been pushed forward. And to me, as I was retiring back then about five years ago, that was you know my, my best moment was seeing all the people that had been working underneath me move up and rise up to even higher levels than, than myself. And um, I always said, you know, you've got to take the baton someday. So here, let's, let's work on this and show you, you know, how I did it. And then I always required them to do it better. Hey, here's how I did it. But times have changed. Technology has changed. And my expectation is you will find a way to do it better. And I challenged them with that. And I think, uh, honestly, it's, it's been like that. They've taken it to a whole nother level. Um, you know, leading by example goes right along with mentorship, like you were saying, Marty, before. And I think giving people the exposure. Again, if you're looking for that passion and things, then give them the exposure, not only to your own leadership style, but to other leadership styles as well. So they can formulate their own. And um, because everybody is gonna lead a little bit different, um, but I do love, I do love, and I think Tammy said this in our last call, transformational leadership versus transactional, right? I love the, the piece of transformational leadership where you're helping someone else find their true talents and find out what they're really good at and then let them run. Let them run with that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love UPS. I love my company. I love my position and um, have always felt grateful for that. I will also say that, you know, leading by example, a lot of times starts in the home and, you know, people who have, you know, are people around them, other authority figures like teachers, like Desiree just mentioned, a teacher can be it, right? As you're growing up or your parents and other friends that are around you because you're learning so much at those young ages. And if you can come up kind of um, watching other people and learning from them and realizing you can learn from everyone, right? You can even learn what not to do. I, believe me, I had a lot of bosses. I learned, oh, I am not doing that, right? 
<laughs> so um, yeah, it, it was a great career. And now I'm really, again, trying to do it in my church and with my grandkids and with other friends that are still in the workforce uh, since I've retired. So it's a, it's a big, big topic. It's a big subject with a lot of different tangents to it. But it's so important to lead by example. Uh, well, you gave me a really good transition because um, You're on me. The, okay. the article that I really enjoyed reading was Why Business Management Should Lead by Example by P Michael Patrick and Forbes. And he, he really acknowledged that there are many different styles of leadership, which you just uh, recognize that. And all will work for different reasons, but the one common thread that was transcendent for the successful business management professionals was that they did lead by example. And um, the benefits of that, that he called out, and I think all um, four of us have meant touched on these, is that one is you can ensure that you're not hypocritical. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, that, I think people look for that. And if they, if, if they have leaders who even get close to that, it's like, there it is. You know, I think yeah. people, it's, it's that, it's that critical. I had a really good example when I worked for Johnson and Johnson, we spent a whole day in um, training on, you know, life that they were trying to life balance and work ethics and work. How do you show up? And, and, but, you know, keeping your life, um, where your family is important, you know, it was a J and J trying to say, look, we, these are, they were so good about the credo and how it was a wonderful environment to work on. So we spent this whole day doing it and the regional manager, um, her like mom died and she left the conference. We're like, yes, you have to leave your mom died. And she came back the next day. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you just negated everything that they just did for a whole days of work here because you just demonstrated that you couldn't stay away for a day to take care of one of the most important moments in your life. And so, you know, it's those type of where I know her thought was, I'm showing that I am going to keep working and show a strong work ethic, which it did, but it, it hurts the culture. Yeah. Oh, Marty, I could tell you so many stories about, you know, you'd have all these wonderful mission statements, right, about, uh, yeah, work-life balance and this and that. Oh, but then all of a sudden, um, the people wouldn't take their vacations. And so right. I would chide, I would chide my directors and my, my managers and say, you just, everything you just said got thrown out the window because you won't even go on vacation. Right. And that's one of the most important things you can really do to refresh yourself, you know, and to be more objective in what you do and to open your mind. So I saw that over, or they, people would come in sick, like it was a badge of honor at that time, right? So <laughs> like, oh, I'm sick, but I'm coming in, you know, um, I think COVID kind of changed that now a little bit, but it's, it's just amazing that Pete, I'm like, what are you doing here? You know, you get sick time, go home. So yeah, I yeah. agree. It, it, it's been a, it's really, it's really frustrating to see organizations have these wonderful mission statements, but when it comes down to the front line, how's it really playing out? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, 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 because um, I actually have a doctorate in executive leadership and in my career, I, everything was, I was going great. Life was good. And I got laid off. I was like, what? And it was a really humbling experience to get laid off first time in my career. Didn't matter if I had exceeds and I was like, you know, doing everything well. They eliminated the position that I was in. Six of us got eliminated like one day to the next. And I took a sabbatical. Thank God I had um, a severance package. And I really wanted to know, I wanted to go back to school, but I wanted to study something that was relevant. And at that time, the global recession the housing industry melted, right? And they're like, oh, if those realtors and loan officers that did those bad loans, shame on them, you know? And they blamed a lot. There was a lot of misinformation. But for me, I really want to know what good leadership looked like and where did it start? And because I know good leadership did not start at the boots on the ground, uh, the loan officers and some of the, you know, realtors did not come up with derivatives. You know, they didn't come up with this smart, amazing math and conversion rates and so forth. 
So that's when I went back to school and I really was enamored with what is leadership? What is this executive leadership? And when I started, it was just back to basics on what is leadership and it stemmed also with a lot of warfare. A lot of wars are studied on leadership. I was like, what? That's, I didn't see the correlation. And then I'm like, yes, I started to learn and understand there's various types of leadership, the good and the bad kind of leadership. But it was one of the best experiences of my of my life going back to school and studying something that I really wanted to thrive on. But just like everything, there was a transactional, there was a transformational, there was servant, there was uh, the dark side of leadership, the narcissistic type of leadership. But it was interesting because there was a book that I read. It was called Leading Minds. Let's see if I can get it close. You know, you can't see it. Anyway, Leading Minds by uh, Howard Gardner. And it had different biographies of different types of leaders around the world. And it was just a real great read because a lot of the great leaders are master storytellers and they learn something. And most of them had some type of trauma in their life or they didn't. They had to overcome a major challenge in their life, uh, such as like uh, Mother Teresa or Margaret Mead, uh, Oppenheimer. So I started reading about other type of leaders that really meant a lot in different careers and industries. But I, I wanted to know what that leadership model looked like so I could see it from a different lens and perspective. So that's why uh, lead by example is something that I'm very passionate about because I've, I'm, I'm always gravitating to that authentic, amazing leader or that great person who speaks really well. But I also look at, you know, do they walk the walk and talk the talk? When you open up that, you know, the hood of the car, is their engine clean, right? <laughs> And that's something that doesn't always happen. And sometimes when you're in the pocket, like uh, Desiree say, or you're in, in the know, you get to know that leader and you're like, mm, you know, that leader is not everything they seem. So that's where I wanted to study that. And it's just something I've always been drawn to with um, great leadership. So thank you for this opportunity, Desiree. You've always collaborated and brought these amazing dynamic women that I learn for, from, and I really consider a colleague and a friend because they bring the best of what they have to NDILC and also NWRB. And that's what I love, this sisterhood that we push each other forward and propel through good leadership and great. So thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, Vanessa. I mean, you highlighted, you know, that you went back to school to get your PhD and you think about you were on the NDLC you took a break because of the changes in the jobs and everything else and came back in full force and, and, and incredible, you know, um, partnership, but to your comment, it's, it's about the relationship and the energy that goes, you know, the push, the push, the push. And so the energy comes from, for me is as much as you love all this that's going on, the energy I get off of these calls and the work that we do together and the conversations, just the taxes and the information chair, it keeps me young, keeps me going. I don't consider a job. I consider it's the excitement. So if I need a moment, like I'll be reading something or doing something constantly and I'm like, oh my God, this fits Kelly, this fits Sammy, this fits Teresa, this fits you know, Mar Vanessa or Marty. And, and, and Marty knows that I'll just be pinging things all the time. She's like, well, how do you find time and where do you curate this stuff? Because I don't like to read books. I like to read snippets. I like to find little things that, oh my gosh, did you see the flood that this, it caused that, that did this, it did this, do you know where we're going to go? And so my energy is what resonates. And this is why, unfortunately, there's several of us that are, you know, had or have uh, sickness or, or traveling or whatever had came out on the, on the session today. But the idea is, is that I need some of that. I want some of that energy. And it's not because it's me, it's you drive me to have that extra energy to give back to you. So it's that cycle of, hey, she smiled, I'm gonna smile. It's that transformal of, of, it, of life is grand, life is wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, but I did wanna say something that when you talked about the leadership that really resonated with me is when you went back to get your PhD for leadership, think about just owning a home or thinking about the environment that you're in the philanthropic side, Marty, and think about Kelly, you're in the corporate arena. You had to check your emotions at the door. You had to check your, your personal life at the door. Um, your relationships were to be strictly platonic and professional. 
and that don't get too close to your employees because we ran that kind of environment. And you think of where we have transpired in the last five, 10 years. And now you look at since the last three years, do we really want to be completely blockade? Because if we don't understand our relationship, the personal life, to take a moment to have that, that unfear <laughs> of safe space to have that conversation, you know what? I've got long COVID. I'm having this problem. This relationship is not working. So my performance might not be perfect, but I wanted you to know and not use it against me to either fire me or not be compelled. It's like when I had to postpone our event this year, I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, okay, wait a second. If health is not your most important thing in life, then what is? Because you're not going to be here tomorrow. So instead of stressing about, is it okay? It is the right thing to do and you're going to be okay for it. And all of you accepted it like we need to move it to a better time because we're not going to be in the pocket and they knew we're not going to be in the pocket. So why expand time, energy, but most importantly, the value of being there to realize the greatest gain if we're not going to be in there in the moment to all enjoy it. So, you know, Desiree, if I can add to that too, I remember at UPS, um, people used to say things to me. And, and one of the things that was quoted was, well, Kelly, it's just business. It's just business. And I'd look right at him and say, it's never just business. It's personal. Are you kidding me? For a lot of reasons, right? Number one, on the relationships you have with people. Don't tell me it's just business. I mean, that doesn't allow you to, you know, as Vanessa said, say things in a hurtful way or say things the wrong way, because you have to realize everything you say is being watched. Everything you say is being due, is being done by other people. It's being, you're being a role model. And um, yeah, I used to laugh at that. It's never just business. There's always a personal side because you're dealing with a person. So, well, yeah. don't you think comments like that are just an uh, excuse? Yes. To, uh, you know, just, you know, bulldoze it through or be unkind, or I think they're just justifying. An excuse for bad leadership. That's yeah. what it is. If you can't take the time, and they're like, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, that takes too much time to talk to every individual. Yeah, that's what leadership is. Yeah. If you want to be a leader, and if you're raising your hand to be that leader, don't try to take shortcuts. So let, 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 me all property say that. let me just share a couple bullet points. We've got about uh, a little less than 15 minutes, but a couple of other bullet points that I loved from this article. And it as, as the benefit of being um, this type of leader is that uh, you gain significant buy-in. So true leaders do this by educating employees on the why behind the entire, the task and the entire pr process, which is what you're saying, Kelly, like, you take the time to explain why this matters, why it's important to the big picture so that people will get buy-in and uh, example leaders will do the work with you. So it's not, you know, they're not just pointing and directing. Um, it allows, it's what you say has more validity. So leading by example shows employees that your suggestions and ideas come from a place of practical knowledge rather than theory. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the truth too, is that great leaders, you trust what they're saying because you know they've been there, done that. They, uh, they have maybe gone before you and are transparent about things that haven't worked. They're not, you know, trying to paint a you know, blue sky of it's always perfect. They know sometimes it doesn't work and it makes you trust them more. And then the last bullet, which I love this, is that you prepare others to follow in your footsteps. And, uh, you know, that's where... Um, we're creating the next generation of leaders. So, what, it, you know, in this changing environment, it's so interesting to navigate that because the expectations of the young people coming up behind us are so different than what we experienced that I think sometimes that's the, the hard part is that, you know, imagine you went to a job and you never were physically in an office to learn the navigating relationships and, you know, what that office environment is like, you know, the, the generations coming up, it's a whole new set of rules that I think sometimes as we're aging in our careers, we're thinking there's not a point of reference that like we've lost this shared point of reference that, um, that, you know, that shows up. And I, I was reading an article about uh, someone that had started out in the financial services world and how 
the environment in that work environment was you had to be the first one in, last one out. So they would sit at their desk until the boss left, and then they felt like they could go home. Yeah, well, Which, UPS. <laughs> when when does that ever happen now? I mean, that, that, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't think that's a thing. Like kids wouldn't, I say kids, but the younger generation, like, what are you talking about? I have to have my me time, you know? Right, right, <laughs> right. You know, an interesting thing too, Marty, like, um, and you have, to, once you start learning these things, you, you can, you know, practice accordingly, but, you know, men, they would always say, oh, I'm ready for that next promotion. They didn't need any rotations. They knew it all immediately. They're ready for the CEO job, right? Women, on the other hand, would be like, oh, wait, I'm not ready. I think I need a little more time. And so you had to learn to kind of push the women up, right? Yeah. Um, and give them more exposure and more opportunities so that they felt comfortable. And then men, you sometimes had to kind of rein in a little bit, like, okay, like, let's just show you like one other facet of the job, okay? Uh, before you become CEO, right? How about you just do like one rotation over here? And, and it was interesting because that's um, what you could use to kind of, kind of make sure you're hitting all the groups in the right way. You know, that you you might need to lead differently, I guess is my point, for different groups of people. Um, again, if you're trying to build diversity, right, and inclusion, you're going to have to reach out to some groups that, that maybe um, value being, you know, quiet. I'm kind of an extrovert, right? But there's groups of people who are like, no, I like the extrovert piece. I want to be an intro. And you kind of had to learn to then sit and talk with them, just kind of one-on-one or whatever. You know, so there's this leadership to e to use within even your own um company or your own position yeah, well i can, really get I can share with you that uh my in my old company i was set out to set up the community outreach projects that we were doing so that was part of my role and um so the community found the community activists there was a corporate community group in orange county and they were doing a kaboom build. So all the companies were going to come in and you sent a team and you wore your you know, company t-shirt and we were all going to do a task, right, to build this playground. And so I physically walked the C-suite floor and said eye to eye, if you are telling me that our corporate community responsibility is important and you're asking me to do this, I need you to be at that park. Because if you're not at that park, you're, say, you're, you're saying it's not, it's not important. And but more so, if you go to that park, you're going to be elbow to elbow with people that you probably never interact with. And you're going to create relationships and loyalty with this, the company because they're going to see you doing the work. And so, um, you know, but it was literally eyeball to eyeball and a little bit of guilt and shame. I don't care. I'll use whatever. It, it worked. Several of them showed up. But the the founder of the company shows up and when we pull into the park you could imagine i look and i see this mounds of what i thought was manure at first which scared me i go oh my god we're going to be moving manure it turned out it was bark which is equally as bad <laughs> and, um, and i just and i'm sitting there going I know, we're gonna we're gonna get the bark job i just know it we're gonna have to move that so, you know you just see the thing coming right and sure enough here's our company we're moving bark <laughs> and they give you a mask because there's so much dust in the bark that you're yeah. going to be a mess. Okay, fine. So we're shoveling bark, moving it over, shoveling bark. And I see the president of our company and there's just sweat, you know, yeah. it's just horrible. <laughs> it was horrible work. And so we, uh, we, we break for lunch and um, he pulls me aside and he says, Hey, do you, is it okay if I leave after lunch? And I said, uh, I said, of course. I said, you've been here. I've washed out. You're just wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. He goes, I think I need to go home. I can't feel my legs. I go, what are you talking about? You can't feel your legs. What are you talking about? He goes, well, I have a bad back and, you know, shoveling. I think I, 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 well, you can't drive if you can't feel your legs. And he goes, no, 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 I'll be fine driving my car. It's fine. That's okay. I go, oh my God. I'm going to take out the leader of our company he's going to get in the car accident going home but you know, it was one of those things where i thought oh bless his heart he was in pain the whole time and he yeah. was miserable but you know i watched the interaction of the you know c-suite people with the employees 
And I had an employee come up to me later and say, you know, I've never met those guys before. It was so nice to be able to just have a conversation about their family or what's going on, you know? And so, um, right. you know, so sometimes trying to create culture change in leadership, you can put your neck on the line. I could have been in big trouble. That was a good one, Marty. <laughs> yeah. So we're at 9.52. Any other examples that you guys want to share? Vanessa's been trying to talk for the last 15 minutes. So please, Vanessa. Oh, no, no, no. It's okay. I completely forgot because I'm laughing. <laughs> Sorry. Right? <laughs> so good. Okay. Yeah, it does. I'm thinking of the time we went and did a Habitat for Humanity build. And um, yeah, I didn't get the job I wanted because I'm like, oh, they had the art section they're building a beautiful mural with artwork i want that one i didn't get that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it did bring a lot of camaraderie it was a wonderful experience and it was a woman built so that was just a really interesting and i had the power tool with the the uh, pneumatic hammer because uh, years ago i did one with that physical hammer i was like oh my god can i have a pneumatic hammer please and they did they had a good pneumatic <laughs> hammers now I've always, they, you know, I got to say too, UPS is, UPS is a huge supporter of the community and um, biggest giver to United Way, et cetera. So they had all kinds of events like that as well. And and it was funny, right? Because you would see, like even myself, right? Here I come, I'm the supposed senior leader, right? I can't do anything. I can barely pound a nail, right? <laughs> and we've, I think they had more fun laughing at me than anything else. <laughs> it was great though. But oh, you know everybody what? Yeah, it puts a level playing field for everybody, right? Yeah. So that was good. I just remember, Marty, to your question with younger generations, that's something that's really interesting is technology is really here to stay. The laptop, the use of laptops for cell phones, you're like, sometimes you think no one is paying attention. No, they're actually taking notes on their cell phone, right? On the notes application, or they're posting what a great thing you're doing on social media. So you just never know different generations learn and do things differently that we just have to embrace it. And sometimes you have to be that curious leader, like, hey, what are you doing over there? Oh, look, I'm putting my notes down in this software. Oh, what software is it? Like now the QR cards, right? That you hit the phone and all the information just transfers over. So we have to be that curious leader to find out what other wonderful generations are doing because we have a lot to learn too. <laughs> yeah, yes. Desiree, any final notes? as the leader of this wonderful gathering. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it, it leads into the next thing is, is that we all had a great laugh, if you think about it. And the idea is, is that even though, you know, here we are leading in so many different verticals and connecting those 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 disparate industries to make the leadership of, of different types, right? Um, how does that bring into the depth of who we are is by these personal relationships. I talk about the storytelling at the campfire, and that's what you did with the CEOs, Marty and, and Vanessa and, and Kelly. So it, it turns us into our next session that we're going to have, which is be accountable for yourself, for your community, for your planet. So what did you just highlight right there? Let's go out and do a bark mill. Now I would have been, I would have signed up for that job to do the bark mill because I love my yard and bark is such a necessity here in the United in 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 California because of you know the weather, just like it is on the East Coast. And then the idea is, is that are we are we putting natural ingredients back into our planet? Okay. And then what are we doing for ourselves? To me, being in the yard is no cell phones, the environment of, of speaking to my planet, seeing it's my planets, to my plants, and understanding the aura of the oxygen they breathe into for my health to make it cleaner and, and cooler that I feel healthy. So that is what we'd go into for next month. But um, I, you know, to sum up this, lead by example is if it's not too, it, to your point, the CEO get out there and shovel the bark. It was healthy for him, even though he hurt his back or, or, or leg or whatever, it was good for him to sweat and good for him to see what you do in your job. So I always believe that no one is too high, nothing's beneath anyone. And we always should see someone else's shoes to be in the moment to actually do the work. And that's what I, I, I strive so for heavily. So with that being said, are we ready to close out? Okay. so. Next month is be accountable for yourself, for your community, for your planet, like I said. 
Um, and it is going to be on November 7th, which I believe is election time again every year that they do that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think every year, I know it's on a national level, but I think it's also on the state level here in California. Uh, the reason I know that is because my son was born um, on election day. So it's one of the things my oldest born, it'll be 39 years this year. So that being said, I want to thank you very much, Marty, for hosting. Uh, like I said, this is on YouTube. We have 140,000 followers, 140,000 views on 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 YouTube. So anytime you want to see and hear, they're all out there on the channel. Um, but if you have any comments or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Um, this is an incredible uh, uh, council. And as you can tell, we're very, very, very passionate, no matter where we are in our career, what we're doing in our life. Um, and nothing's off limits to really connect the dots and make a better quality life, right? So thank you all. Please stay healthy um, and, and take care of yourself. And we'll see you next time on, on October, excuse me, on November 7th. So anyway, have a great one. And, and thank you very much, Marty, for hosting. Everyone. Everyone. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.